Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We're talking today. We're talking about waves and sound. Um, so we saw from the gizmo yesterday. This first little part here is going to be review of the first couple slides. Um, so a wave that's just a vibration or some disturbance in space. In order for any kind of wave to happen, whether it's a sound wave, a light wave, anything, any of those different types of waves to happen, a physical wave, uh, we need some kind of substance for that wave to travel through, which we just call our medium. So if we don't have any material, if we don't have any substance, there's no sound wave that's going to be produced or, or transferred, which is why there's no sound in outer space. It's a vacuum out in space. As soon as you leave our atmosphere, there's no particles for that sound wave to be transferred through, so there's no sound. So the first of our two different types of waves, longitudinal, so these are also called sometimes called compression waves. So in here we have a, a, a spring for my, for my little picture here, or my particles that are moving horizontally, so they're moving left to right. So it's producing this little these areas of compressions and then these areas of decompressions, which we call rarefactions. So the space between a compression and another compression, or a rarefaction and another rarefaction, is what we just consider the, the wavelength, so the length of one, one whole wave. So we've got a nice little picture here that demonstrates a little bit better what it looks like when we actually have particles that are being compressed. So here, if you notice, my particles are not moving. It looks like it. If you just kind of glance at my pictures, it really does look like the particles are being pushed from one one end all the way down to the other. But if you pick one out, you can actually see that they're just wiggling back and forth. It's that energy that's being transferred from one to the other. They're really just bumping into each other and then going back to where they started, and then bumping into each other and going back to where they started. Transverse wave is what we traditionally think of when you think of a wave. So this is mostly what waves in water do. Um, this is kind of what we, we picture when we look at waves. And this is actually the picture. This is a pretty standard sinusoidal wave, so a sine wave. So all of you I know covered this in algebra 2. Um, and this is just what that graph looks like. So we've got our, our crests up at the top of our waves, our troughs on the bottom. The amplitude is from this equilibrium position. So this is like the center of our graph. What we would usually, on a, you know, in an algebra 2 problem, this would be our x-axis. So just that distance from the x-axis up to the, the crest, or that equilibrium position down to the trough, is my amplitude. So that's just how far away my wave gets from, re from at rest. And then my wavelength is pretty much the same thing. It's just from crest to crest, from trough to trough, what that distance is. If you're going to go from equilibrium to equilibrium, you just need to make sure it includes one full cycle. You can't just go from point to point on my equilibrium because you might end up with something like this where you're only counting the distance of a crest instead of the entire wave. So here, the particles as they move are actually moving perpendicular to the direction of my wave. So if you picture my wave going from left to right, my particles are moving up and down. So they're going to be perpendicular to that. And again here, this is a little easier to see that my particles are not actually moving. They're just wiggling up and down in this case. And that's how that, again, that energy is being transferred. A couple other things, uh, characteristics of a wave. We talked about amplitude already. So that's just the maximum distance my particles in a wave vibrate from their at-rest positions. So no matter if it's transverse or if it's longitudinal, they're either going to be moving left to right or up and down. Or And we know, so we saw the combined waves as well in the gizmo. That's just going to, still going to be, my amplitude is how far away from that at-rest position that they get. So however far away they get up, down, left, right. With my combined my combined waves in a circle, how far that distance is that they, at most maximum, reach away from that at rest position. And then my frequency. This is just the number of waves in a given period of time. So standard unit that we'll be using is hertz. So that's cycles per second. So how many cycles we get in a single second. This is just kind of helping us translate from one, one form to the other, one different way of modeling our waves in another. So here this is an acoustic longitudinal wave. So again, this is a compression wave. And this is just showing us a way that we could represent it using a graph. So using what we traditionally think of for a wave, this is just measuring the maximum and the minimum sound pressure to the equilibrium. So here this is just our regular atmospheric pressure. 
we're going to experience some high pressures, some low pressures, and that's just going to produce our wave. So it's still our wavelength is again from compression to compression, crest to crest, trough to trough. And here to calculate frequency, again, that's just waves per time period. So again, hertz is my standard unit, and that's the number of waves per second. But once again, just emphasizing this up top, waves transfer the energy without transferring the matter. So you can pick out, I've got these little red dots here that you can watch wiggle back and forth. But again, they're not being actually moved other than back and forth from their equilibrium position. So back and forth from where their rest is. Velocity. This is the same thing as wave speed that you guys did on the gizmo. So they're used interchangeably in, in waves. So there's not a big difference between my wave velocity and my wave speed. And this is, again, you can calculate it by frequency times your wavelength, so how many cycles per second you do, times the, the length of a given wave. So since this is cycles per second, wavelength is my distance, your measurements are going to be in meters per second. So that's, that's how we get that calculation. There is another way of doing your wave velocity, but we'll talk about that in just a second. So properties of sound. We've got two main ones that we'll talk about today. We're going to do, spend a whole other day on it uh, later this week or beginning of next week for uh, characteristics of sound when we start talking about um, pitch and producing those sounds, making we'll actually have a project this this section where we're going to be where you're going to be making a musical instrument. So pitch that's just the actual tone of what someone sounds like. So how high or how low that sound is when you hear it. That's just the pitch of it. And then loudness, that's obviously just the same thing as like the volume. So how loud or how soft the sound is perceived. This is just a nice little reference. You can take a look at this with a lot more detail. This is just our standard um, volumes that we experience on a regular basis. So decibels, that's the dBS here that we're talking about. That's just our standard unit for measuring the loudness of something. So at home, between you know just regular TV being on, appliances and all that stuff, 40 to 50 decibels, you've got no problem with hearing damage. But as you start experiencing louder and louder things and you increase those decibels, you're going to have increased hearing damage. Your, your eardrums can only handle so much in terms of loudness, so much energy being pumped at your ears that it can only handle so much. So as soon as you start getting up to those higher volumes, those higher decibels, you start to have some, some long-term damage or some, some severe pain depending on where you're at. Which, again, we'll also, there's an episode of Mythbusters that we'll watch probably tomorrow or Friday um, where they try and m bust the myth of whether you can shatter a wine glass with just your voice. We've got two other different kinds of sound based on whether, basically whether or not humans can hear it or not. Ultrasound, that's just sound waves that are above our normal hearing range in terms of their frequency. So here that's anywhere from 20,000 to 100,000 hertz. So here this is just kilohertz, so 20,000 to 100,000 hertz. And then infrasound, that's just lower than the normal human range, so that's 20 to 200 hertz. Um, ultrasound, this is the same thing as if you're going to go get an ultrasound at the doctor. So when you know women are pregnant, we go and, they go and get ultrasounds to, to look and see give us a better picture of what's going on inside their stomachs without having any kind of invasive, dangerous um, tests done or MRIs and everything that could damage a baby that might be in there. So this is literally just pumping high-frequency sound waves and then based on how they you know, rebound and reflect and are reabsorbed by the machine, tells, it gives you an idea of what, what it looks like inside. And then infrasound, those are just lower than normal frequencies. So they've actually discovered that elephants can communicate to each other over very, very, very large distances because of this infrasound. They have such a low tone that we didn't realize that they were there until, I think it was probably about 15, 20 years ago. They started doing recordings and realized that they are actually communicating to each other using a very low frequency. And because the frequency is so low, if they have the same energy that they put into it, because of the low frequency, they're able to transmit it a much, much farther distance, which is really interesting. So wave speed, we already talked about that, same thing as velocity. So this is just kind of your important formulas. So the other way, like I told you before, there's another way of calculating wave speed. So wave speed could be 
the distance that your waves travel over a given time period. So if you know that your wave travels a thousand meters in the course of 10 seconds, then your wave velocity would just be 100 meters per second, 1,000 divided by 10. So this delta x, my change in position, this is usually, we we'll use this for my wavelength. Here, the specific variable that we use, the letter we use for wavelength, that's lambda, it's like an upside down y. That's my wavelength. And then my frequency, this is just one over my period. So it's just a reciprocal of my period. And usually, again, capital T, we did this before, this is my period, this is the time that it takes to do one cycle. But that's going to be our way of also calculating my frequency. So here we've got a little example that we're going to do. So a harmonic wave, that just means a, a whole numbered wave, so we don't have any partial waves in what we're looking at, um, is traveling along a rope. They observe that the oscillator, so the thing that's producing the, the movement of the particles, the movement of the rope, generates a wave that's 40 vibrations in the course of 30 seconds. So 40 oscillations, 40 times up and down in 30 seconds. And we also know that the rope travels 425 centimeters in 10 seconds. So that wave that travels along the rope, 425 centimeters in 10 seconds. And we're trying to calculate what the wavelength is. So if we want wavelength, the only equation we know for wavelength is this last one. So we know that the velocity, the speed of my wave, is my wavelength times my frequency. So if we can calculate those other two things, then we can find what our wavelength is. So for my frequency, this is how many cycles per second we have. That's my measurement in hertz. They tell us from this first description, we do 40 vibrations, so 40 waves, in 30 seconds. So 40 over 30 is just 1.33 repeated hertz. And then my velocity, we're using that new, that alternative method of doing it. So here, my, my standard unit we know for velocity would be meters per second. So this is the distance in meters that my wave travels in that time period. So they tell me that it goes 425 centimeters, which would be 4.25 meters in 10 seconds. So 0.425 meters per second. So if we just plug that into our last equation here, my wavelength is my velocity divided by my frequency, I get 0.319 meters. Okay, so standing waves, this is kind of the, the basis of what we'll be talking about for most of sound, and especially when we get to music. Um, a standing wave is just produced when that wave starts reflecting back on itself. So you can almost picture this like a rope that is attached on both ends, and the more you oscillated up and down is you're going to create these these wave patterns here. You've probably done this before maybe with like a jump rope down on like on the floor if you ever make it like kind of like wiggle like a snake. The faster you move it you almost have this this pattern going on where you can see waves on top of waves. And so this is what a standing wave is and here rather than talking about it in terms of crest to crest, trough to trough, we're looking at antinodes and nodes. So if we think about this equilibrium position here down in the center of my wave, anywhere where those two waves meet each other at that equilibrium is what we call a node. Anywhere where we are the maximum distance away from each other, so from where we have a crest and a trough stacked on top of each other, that's an antinode. So that's our maximum amplitude. Our node will be an amplitude of zero. So sound waves are the most common type of standing wave, and they're caused by a resonance, which Resonance is just some kind of forced vibration that matches what that object's nat natural frequency is. So every object has its own natural frequency that it will vibrate at based on what it's made of, the shape of it, the, you know, the size of it, how big it is. Um, and again, that what we, like I have mentioned in here, we'll look at an episode of Mythbusters where they bust the myth of whether you can shatter a wine glass. Um, by just singing a musical note to it. Um, you can actually find for a lot of objects what the natural frequency is. So if you've ever gotten like your finger wet and just rubbed the outside rim of a, of a glass of like a wine glass or a glass of water, um, you start hearing that kind of hum. That's the natural frequency that that object has. So if you have an object that's vibrating the same resonance of that frequency, you'll actually produce sound, which is what's happening for that. So different sounds you hear um, 
produce different sound waves. So depending on kind of basically what the pattern is, how ugly or how nice looking it is, tells you what different kinds of sound we'll hear. Which again, this is getting more into the second part of this section where we talk about music and, and notes. So if the sound waves, the, the compressions and the decompressions, the rarefactions and all that stuff, if it's just kind of a random jagged wave where there's some, you know, some increase in pressure, some decrease in pressure, that's just what we consider to be noise. So there's no set pattern to it, there's no tone to it, there's no distinguishable pitch to it, it's just noise. Uh, a pure tone, what we consider a pure tone, is just a single pitch consistently throughout my sound wave. So you've got a constant amplitude above and below that is happening from my wave. So that, that compression and rarefaction, those distances that those particles are traveling between, would be consistent throughout. So if we just hit a, hear a single note, a, a single tone, that's just going to be the case for this middle graph. And then musical notes are not just necessarily a single pitch or a single tone, but there is a much more distinct pattern to it. And you're going to have this mirrored shape in my graph where what happens above for my compression, what happens above my equilibrium, and what happens below my equilibrium mirror themselves. So it might not be a nice smooth curve, but you've definitely got that that consistent change of compression decompression that's happening and that's just what we consider to be a musical note but once again we'll spend a lot more time talking about musical notes and and tones and and what we can consider to make music with uh, later on in this chapter so last last thing kind of thing and a half um, to talk about is the doppler effect which you've probably heard of i know you've experienced it whether you realize that that's the name for it or not so the Doppler effect, that's just the apparent change in your frequency based on the motion of either the listener or the source of the sound. So if something is driving by you on the road, as it approaches you, it sounds much higher in frequency. So it's a much higher pitch, a much higher tone. And then as soon as it passes you, you experience that low frequency. So it's kind of that, that, that sound of as a car drives by, that meow that happens where it sounds really, really high-pitched as it approaches you, but then it's much lower after it drives by. It's not actually a change in pitch, but because the sound waves are being compressed as they are being pushed towards you, the wavelength is much shorter, which changes the pitch that you hear. Um, and then as it, after it drives by you, they stop compressing those wavelengths behind, and then it starts having a longer wavelength, which creates a lower frequency, because we know those wave speeds are still going to be consistent. So if one goes up, the other goes down. Wave, wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional if we have a consistent speed. And that's really what the Doppler effect is. Come on. Click. Oh, now it catches up. Um, so if we have a sound that's moving fast enough, so that's the da Doppler effect is what we just talked about. If we have some a source that's moving fast enough where it's at the speed of sound or faster than the speed of sound, you actually have this the sound waves that will pile up in front of the object, and then they all get dispersed in this shock wave that we call a sonic boom. So that's what you see, like if you've seen planes. I've got a nice little picture here. Um, you got if you have planes that are breaking the sound barrier, they talk about that a lot. If something breaks the sound barrier, that just means that the object is moving faster than the speed of sound. So it's moving so quickly that all of those sound waves that it's producing pile up in front of it, and then it just kind of releases them all in one big boom. So you actually hear it. It's very, very loud. It's equivalent to something like five jet engines being released at once. So it is very, is very impressive to watch. And again, I think in the episode of Mythbusters, they talk about breaking the sound barrier. Um, but this is actually what it looks like. This is a, a cloud that's produced because you have such a great amount of energy that's released upon that sonic boom that it actually creates this, takes the moisture in the air and creates it into a cloud. So it takes it just kind of disperses it all at once. And you actually, I really like this part because you can even see the different places where any kind, anywhere you have, um, kind of a change in steepness where you have that space where a, a, a kind of a cone is going to be produced that it's allowing those waves that are 
compressed together that are being pushed along to finally be released after you hit that, you know, uh, on the, in this case, on the back side of the, the windscreen. So that's all I got for you today. Um, like I said, we will spend a lot more time later on um, talking about more specifically music and tones and how we can produce them, standing waves and harmonics and all that good stuff. But for right now, that just gives us a good idea for what, what how sound waves are produced and just kind of a general review of, of, of waves in general. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for listening.